What is the state of America's health? What is the state of American's health? Oh my, uh, I wish it would say, I wish I could say it was robust and glowing. But the truth is every 30 seconds in this country, someone grabs their chest and falls over with a heart attack and dies. Um, we have rampant vascular disease, blood vessel disease, from atherosclerosis, largely from our diet. Uh, we have a spreading obesity uh, epidemic, uh, I guess kind of pun intended. Uh, and autoimmune diseases are increasing, gastrointestinal diseases like acid reflux and uh, colitis are increasing. Uh, we are not a healthy country, and it's largely due because we're so rich uh, and we feel we're Americans, we can eat anything we want. Well, we can, but your artery's got something to say about that. Your colon's got something to say about that. And so we're suffering these, these diseases but rather than look at what we're eating, we want that pill, we want that vaccine, we want something, just make it go away, doctors, so I can keep eating my buffalo wings and my spare ribs and my burgers. And uh, as a result, we're getting more obese and more clogged up and uh, uh, we're not a healthy society because we don't want to face the truth uh, that what we're eating really does matter. And it's not, it's not a healthy diet that we're on. So state of health compared to uh, many countries around the world, especially Scandinavian countries where people are starting to make this connection, uh, we've got a lot of catching up to do. Gary Taubes reports several benefits from the keto diet. What's your response to that? Well, this is a dietary philosophy that says we want to be in a state of ketosis. And what that means is when the body shifts away from what most people believe is our standard diet. We are carbohydrate eating creatures uh, as the gorillas and bonobos uh, graze in their forests. Uh, they're eating carbohydrates, they're eating leaves and fruits. And you can see from the magnificent muscles on a gorilla's body, it certainly seems to be adequate. Ask any giraffe or rhinoceros or buffalo, you, you know, you get all the proteins and vitamins and minerals you need from a, from a plant-based uh, high carbohydrate diet in its whole form. Uh, but the folks in the keto camp uh, say, now uh, we should shift to a fat-based diet. Fats are very difficult to come by out in the natural world, by the way. Uh, and when we force our bodies to burn fats, then these acidic molecules called ketones are released into the bloodstream. They suppress the appetite and people lose weight. And as they lose weight, certain, especially if they started out obese and diabetic and hypertensive, like so many Americans do, uh, a few weeks of ketosis, boy, you're going to notice a weight loss. And that's going to improve your, your diabetes control. It'll, you may notice a drop in cholesterol levels. Uh, and uh, people say, hey, keto, but look at all the wonderful changes it does. Need less insulin, all of that. So there's a real strong push. Uh, for keto diets. But, uh, and, and people like to taste the steak in their mouth. So, oh boy, man, I can eat all the meat I want. Yes, absolutely, it's good for you. Yes, but as I said earlier, you know, arteries got something to say about that. And the studies that people use to support this, these are short-term studies. The longest I've seen is two years. Uh, and that one's just recently come out. But when you look at what really happens to these people long-term, there's many studies already showing that first of all, these ketogenic diets, which are mostly meats and oils and some vegetables, uh, that's a great way to give yourself vitamin deficiencies and mineral deficiencies, because you're, you're really cutting down the, the kind of plants that you're eating, all the fruits go, a lot of the yellow vegetables, starchy vegetables go. Um, the lack of healthy fiber is going to change the bacteria in your gut and, and you're going to start spawning microbes down in your intestinal tract that produce all sorts of molecules that, that damage the body, uh, trimethylamine, uh, et cetera. Uh, the lack of fiber is as a low fiber diet, so people wind up constipated and that increases the risk of, of uh, colon disease, diverticuli, et cetera. And what are we doing to the arteries? Uh, you can say, oh, my cholesterol is down, yay. But meanwhile, the arteries are, are very complex muscular tubes that dilate when you need more blood to the muscles and constrict uh, when you've got to shunt blood other places. 
Well, a high fat diet paralyzes, stuns the endothelial cells that line the arteries and you lose that, that important nitric oxide production that allows for the vasodilation. They're not looking at that. Um, when people eat simple sugars, like you know, the fructose and cola drinks, et cetera, these nasty molecules called advanced glycation end products could form that damage our tissues. Well, it turns out as the keto folks saying, aha, see, we're not eating any of those simple sugars, which is a good idea. Yay, keto, I bet they're right. But it's turning out whoever thought that some of the ketones, namely acetone, can turn into a molecule called methylglyoxal that creates these same advanced glycation end products and that ages our tissues and it damages our proteins. Um, this is a high protein diet. You're eating meat, 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 and you flood the, the body with, uh, especially the liver, with all these amino acids from the protein. The liver responds and it responds by putting out a gush of this very powerful hormone called insulin-like growth factor one, IGF-1. And it drives cancer growth throughout the body. It drives aging genes to turn on. And just high protein diets not only age us, it, and clearly when you look at the aging genes like TORC1, uh, they respond to high protein diets. And when you follow this along to see who's still alive eating high protein diets, you find out uh, not many folks. Uh, uh, when you look at just the population studies, oh, the Eskimos and the and the uh, the, the Bushmen in uh, in Kenya, well, they die at age forty, for, you know, from vascular diseases. They're, they're not long lived people, and there's no question that. Uh, the studies, if you look up animal-based diet and all-cause mortality, there's no question, the more animal flesh you eat, the shorter your lifespan. So I tell the folks who are enamored by the, the keto diets, don't be seduced by these early changes. Most of the weight loss is water out of your tissues. It's not friendly to your muscles. The muscles really diminish down uh, and folks report trouble, trouble going out for runs and doing workouts at gyms on these ketogenic diets. It is not helpful uh, for, for good uh, athletic performance. I said, no, no matter, yeah, your cholesterol may come down, your diabetes may get a bit managed, easier to manage, but at what cost? What are you really doing to our, your body? We are not carnivorous apes. We didn't go, you know, from mammoth to, to, to dead zebra on the plains and, and just, you know, eat meat, meat, meat. Well, we were clearly carbohydrate eating creatures. Most of the calories brought into the ancient Paleolithic camps were gathered by the women who spent all day digging up these starchy roots and tubers. Uh, that's where most of the calories came from in the ancient Paleolithic camps. And we know that by examining the, the fossilized fecal droppings from these folks. They were massive stool masses. You got to eat a lot of fiber, to, a lot of plant fiber to do that. And so uh, the, this idea of the mighty hunter living on mastodon meat was, is a myth. Uh, we were starchivores then, we're starchivores now. Uh, and again, these early changes for weight loss and better diabetes control, they cause, come at way too great a cost. And, uh, and I urge people, don't be seduced. We are plant-eating hominids. We have fingers on our hands, not claws. We've got long intestines for digesting fiber. We've got saliva with starch digesting enzymes. Eat a whole plant food diet and you're going to wind up lean and healthy without a lot of the problems that the keto folks are going to run into, I fear. A recent study claimed vegans have more bone fractures. Is this true? This was a disturbing study that came out a few months ago, certainly caught my attention and a lot of other docs, but I wasn't really surprised when I looked at the, the study uh, as far as who among the vegans really got the fractures. Uh, it turns out, you know, a little bit of bone physiology here. Bones respond like muscles do. The more you use your muscles, da -da -da, the more they hypertrophy and get bigger and stronger. Well, your bones work the same way. The more you use your bones, um, the more the little bone building cells, the osteoblasts spin out new bone. And uh, the, the serving arm on a professional tennis player has a greater bone density than, the, uh, than their non-serving arm there. Uh, it's called Wolf's Law of Bones, and, they, uh, it clearly, and it clearly states the more you use the bones, the stronger you get, the stronger the bones get. 
Well, we become sedentary. Yeah, we sit when we eat, we sit when we work, we sit when we travel, we sit, 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 and our bones are dissolving. That's the major cause of osteoporosis. It's not a calcium deficiency. Uh, the whole bone tissue is dissolving. Taking calcium pills is not going to make your bones magically you know, produce more tissue. What, what makes them uh, uh, produce more bone tissue is using your bones, especially against gravity. We used to be physical men and women, even 100, 200 years ago. We, we, we spent all day working in the garden, lifting heavy tools and buckets of soil and carrying loads of firewood up on the roof, pounding in shingles, using, uh, using our bodies. And osteoporosis wasn't an issue then. But now we've become so sedentary that our bones are dissolving. And when you look at the, the vegans who may have a and that you do need, you know, a good five, 700 milligrams of calcium at least. And the folks who in that study who got the most fractures when they fell uh, were not only the, the vegans eating the least amount of calcium, but they were little petite women. And it's been well known that all, whether they eat meat or they're vegans, petite, especially Caucasian women with, with a low bone density to begin with, when you, when you only weigh 92 pounds or whatever, you, you ask so little of your skeleton as you're walking on this earth that, that they don't, those lovely ladies don't stress their bones at all. And so, so the lack of gravitational challenge uh, is really behind, and, and a lowish calcium uh, diet is really why those the, the petite women in, uh, in the vegan population suffer the most fractures. And so there's a lesson. Um, don't, you know, don't slouch on your calcium intake. More is not better. It's not a matter of taking handfuls of calcium tablets. And I would, I would never, if a woman needs supplements, 200, 300 milligrams of calcium in a supplement is enough because the rest should, you should make your five, 700 milligrams of calcium from all the dark green leafy vegetables you're eating. You should be having big helpings of kale and chard and broccoli and Brussels sprouts. Uh, and, uh, and fortify calcium fortified soy milk. There's, there's places to get calcium in your diet. And so you should do that. Don't rely on these calcium tablets because that can calcify arteries and set you up for, for blood clots. It's, it's not a matter of taking those calcium tablets. But very importantly, as I mentioned in my videos, like uh, one called Healthy Bones on my website, got to use your bones. And I, I recommend certainly the petite women, but all people on plant-based diets or who are at risk of osteoporosis, um, get a little weighted vest off, uh, off uh, Amazon or online there, and a little, a little five pound, seven pound weighted vest, uh, grab a couple of three pound hand weights, put on a sweatshirt and go for a walk. And, uh, and you know, there's a thousand steps in a mile. And so you walk a mile with a lightweighted vest and a couple of hand weights. Every step you take, a little wow of weight you know, force goes down your spine and down your hips a thousand times every mile that you walk. And it's that repeated gravitational force going down your, 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 your bones. That's what wakes up the osteoblast. Then they'll spin out new bone. So, so especially to those petite ladies, Eat lots of greens and, and find a way to, to stretch your bones a little bit. Uh, those elastic stretch bands work. Uh, Dr. Furman's got a wonderful tape on uh, osteoporosis protection for life. So use your bones, eat enough, uh, eat enough greens, get your calcium, and don't let that, uh, that study say, oh, vegan diets are not healthy. They are, but, but there is a lesson for us to learn there. So eat your greens and use your bones and you ought to be fine. Are all fruits healthy? Are some too sugary due to hybridization and not being native to our area, such as pineapples, mangoes, seedless grapes, bananas? Oh my, uh, you know, fruits are so wonderful and everybody should eat a few pieces of fruit a day. I'm not, I'm not anti-fruit whatsoever, but, and this may be a recurring theme in our questions and answers here. But to borrow a phrase from our colleagues in toxicology, the study of poisons, they say the dose makes the poison. Um, uh, everybody can handle a little bit of arsenic, eat a lot of it, you're going to have problems. Well, the same thing kind of applies to the fruits. You know, everybody, I don't know anybody who can't handle one mango or one bunch of grapes. Enjoy it. It's wonderful. Should you be eating 10 or 15 mangoes? Probably not. That gets to be a lot of sugar. 
So, you know, the majority of what goes down your gullet should be whole plant foods, whole grains, potatoes, fruits, vegetables, um, uh, um, and, and legumes, nuts, seeds, etc. And a couple of pieces of fruit uh, during the day. Uh, it's hard to see that that's going to cause anybody a, a problem. Now, the folks who call themselves fruitarians and really do live on uh, mangoes and bananas, etc., I see them from time to time. I can't say they look like they've got glowing health. Uh, uh, the, often their, their teeth are in terrible condition from all the sugar and the acids really uh, dissolve the enamel off the teeth there. It, it can be a really risky diet that way. And I don't know what all that fruit sugars, what kind of microbes that's spawning down in their gut as well. And I have some concerns about that and whether they may be shortchanging themselves of, uh, of various nutrients. So I'm not a big fan of pure fruit diets. And those folks, as I said, because of the dysbiosis they create, uh, dental health, possible infection, gum infections. Uh, yeah, though, if you're eating that fruit on that level, you, it might be too much fruit sugar. But by and large, if you're eating, you know, grains and legumes and, and vegetables, et cetera, uh, a couple of apples or a banana or a mango uh, a couple times a day, uh, enjoy it. You have no, no fear about them. Are all whole grains okay to eat? Are there any exceptions? For example, some grains like wheat, barley, and oats have gluten, but quinoa, millet, amaranth, teff, buckwheat, and wild rice have no gluten. Should we try to eat the grains with no gluten? Fascinating question. And I've been in the plant-based nutrition game here for going on 40 years. And you watch various fads go by, the hypoglycemia and the candida, the and, uh, and, uh, you know, Lyme disease, not that those aren't real conditions, but, you know, some people, the public really seizes on them. And, and uh, so I watched the gluten wave go by. And um, though I must admit, it, uh, as I was uh, doing research for our master classes in plant-based nutrition, uh, I was forced to look at the, the gluten issue. And I was surprised how many times uh, in various diseases, from Crohn's disease and colitis, gluten plays a role. Psoriasis of the skin, gluten plays a role. Uh, hypertension, asthma. And it, it did show up in, in honest-to-goodness medical studies, enough to make me say, mm, something to this gluten thing. But I love gluten, and I have no problem. And the majority of people I know have no problem eating uh, whole grain breads, etc., with the, or that have uh, whole wheat in them. So, so how do you make some sense out of this? Um, first of all, uh, and your question was well phrased uh, because uh, the, the word grain is, you know, is a big broad brush there. And, but the question did make the delineation. The true grains are in the grass family, uh, oats, wheat, corn, barley, rye. These are forms of grasses. And if, and if you see the whole plant, you can see, yeah, that's my lawn grass big, you know, and, and, and the little seeds on your, on your lawn grass, those are the wheat kernels or the barley kernels, etc. Those are, if they're in the grass family, they're, they're going to have gluten in them. Um, if you have the slightest uh, suspicion that gluten is causing a problem. You read, uh, you read a bunch of bread or pasta, and the next day, either you've got abdominal distress or uh, extra uh, GI problems, like a skin rash, sore joints, running nose, sore eyes. Um, if there's the slightest hint that it might be um, a gluten issue, well, you've got the ultimate and free lab test maneuver available to you. Stop eating it for a month or two. And if your symptoms magically go away, great. Then when you're feeling really good one day and you don't have much to do the next day, have three slices of whole wheat bread and uh, you know, do a challenge and see how you feel the next day. If you feel fine, then probably the gluten wasn't an issue. But if any of those symptoms come back, that's all you need to know. You're probably gluten sensitive. You, know, you probably want to walk around that. Now that said, Going back to our broad brush, people say grains, but there is, as your question stated, a bunch of non-glutinous grains uh, that in, in that family are quinoa, millet, amaranth, buckwheat. Um, and these are small little uh, grain-like 
uh, actually they're seeds and they're fruits. And, and if you look at their parent plant, they're clearly not grasses. They are quinoa is a big leafy green bush. Uh, and most of these are, are, are green leafy plants. Uh, they're clearly not in the grass family and they have no gluten. And so if there's any question, uh, move on over to the non-glutinous grain-like foods. Uh, so you can call them grains, but know that they're really not because they're not in the grass family. But, and we become, especially as the arsenic and the rice thing has come up, we've, we've eaten less and less rice and more and more quinoa and millet and buckwheat. We just love them, throw them in the soup, throw them onto salads. And so uh, to sum up, uh, if there's any question about gluten, stop eating it for, for a month or two or three and then re-challenge yourself and see how you feel. Uh, and if, there, if you just don't feel good about eating uh, true grains with gluten, then go to the non-glutinous grains and you'll do fine. They're, they're wonderful and, and uh, very versatile and we find all sorts of new ways to use them. So important question, but certainly nothing to make people uh, veer away from a whole food plant-based diet. Are animal products healthy to eat if they come from organic, grass-fed, free-range animals? Oh my, uh, that question about organic grass fed. Animal muscle is animal muscle. And inherently, when you bite into the muscle of an animal, you're taking in saturated fat that, that promotes inflammation and damages the artery wall. You're taking in a big bite of protein that creates uh, IGF-1 release uh, and increases the aging process in the body. Um, you're, you're biting into the, the, the living, uh, well, the recently living tissue of, of another mammal usually. And so um, you're biting into, and not to freak out you know, the listeners, but to being anatomically correct, as you bite into that chicken breast or that turkey leg or that burger, now you're biting into muscle and nerve and tendon and ligament and cartilage. Um, well, if you've got a leaky gut from the alcohol or pesticides or antibiotics, some fragments of the, that animal tissue is going to be out in your bloodstream. Now you got the proteins of another animal's muscle, another animal's connective tissue We're floating out in your bloodstream. Well, might that not create antibodies that, that look for muscle and tendon to lock onto, and they may find it in your own body. Is it so there's a suspicion that it's this phenomenon that leads to these autoimmune diseases like lupus and rheumatoid arthritis uh, for, for meeting somebody else's muscle and nerve tissue, you wind up uh, uh, producing antibodies against them. And so whether it was organic or not, whether it was grass fed or not, uh, uh, animal muscle is animal muscle. And also while we're talking about contaminants, um, <clears throat> all animals go through the slaughterhouse, even organic grass-fed ones, and the cows and the pigs, etc., and they get shot in the head and come and be killed. And they get hung up and they are eviscerated. The, the, the abdominal cavity is open and their intestinal tract is yarded out. And in that process, the contents of the, of the gut of the pig or the cow or the chicken uh, leaks all over and along with their, um, along with their uh, bacterial content. And if you take a culture tube and walk through any slaughterhouse and swab the cutting surface where they're all dismantling these animals, you can culture off uh, Salmonella, Shigella, E. coli, some, Clostridia, Pseudomonas, all these rough, tough bacterial uh, pathogens uh, from the animal's gut. Why am I taking you down this road? Because that means that every chicken breast, every steak, uh, every chop that leaves the slaughterhouse has a coating of these enteric, these gut bacteria from the animals on the surface. Well, uh, it's wrapped up in clear plastic and sent to your supermarket where under the ultraviolet light, now these bacteria are killed, they die. That's the idea of the ultraviolet light. Well, when these bacteria die, their cell walls break apart and release this nasty lipopolysaccharide called endotoxin. Endotoxin is nasty stuff. Any doctor who spent time in intensive care unit and has seen people in endotoxic shock and it kills you. It depresses the heart. It sets off the histamine release and blood clotting and free radical formation. Endotoxic is nasty stuff. And it's heat stable. 
cooking the burger, grilling the, the chicken breasts, uh, broiling the steak does not get rid of the endotoxin. So people are eating a meat-based diet, organic or not, are giving themselves a side of endotoxin three times a day. Only, uh, and that causes problems. Only, and it makes gut leak, et cetera. Only animals make this sialic acid called new 5 gc and that sets off inflammation throughout the body. And our paleo and keto friends were giving themselves a shot of new 5 gc three times a day. So all the way around, whether it's organic or not, eating animals uh, is for mountain lions and, and ferrets, but it's, uh, it's not for us uh, plant-eating hominids, organic or not. And we've got to stop kidding ourselves. And uh, I've got a sign in my uh, a slide in my slideshow, welcome to camp, stop kidding yourself. And uh, that's what's required uh, when it comes to organic grass fed beef, et cetera. Yes, there's fewer pesticides, but that's the, uh, that's the, the uh, smallest part of it. And by the way, if you care about the environment, uh, the grass fed beef put out more greenhouse gases than the, than the feedlot beef because the feedlot animals are killed after 16 months. The, to, to raise a, a grass fed animal to the size where it's worthwhile slaughtering them, they're, they're, it takes three years, four years. So that's three or four years these animals are grazing, tearing up the prairie and breathing out more carbon dioxide, belching out more methane. They're an environmental disaster. So uh, no matter how you look at it, organic grass-fed anything is no bargain for the planet or for our health. Our <clears throat> excuse me. Our medical school students taught about the benefits of a whole food plant-based I don't know how many times in recent years I've apologized to patients for my colleagues' abysmal ignorance of the effect of our patients' diet on these diseases they're bringing to us. We practice medicine like what our patients are eating has no effect on these diseases when actually that's why they're sitting in front of us, overweight, diabetic, hypertensive, clogged up and inflamed from what they're running through their bloodstream every few hours with the burgers and the beef and the, the, and the buffalo wings. And, uh, and yet not a word is mentioned uh, in medical school. We just blow right past that. The, the patient's diet, oh, don't get into that. Everybody's differently. You get, don't, you'll insult them culturally. It's their culture. They have to eat what they have to eat. You just, you just prescribe the statins and the, and the beta blockers and the metformin and have them come back in a month. Well, that's a dismal, hopeless kind of medicine. You're telling the patient you will always be sick. You'll always be diabetic. And it reduces the doctor to the manager of chronic disease. I can't cure you, but I'll, I'll manage your chronic disease. I'll manage your diabetes. I'll manage your high blood. I didn't go into medicine to manage chronic disease. I wanted to cure people. And every one of the major killer diseases that most doctors spend the majority of their waking hours treating, obesity, type 2 diabetes, hypertension, clogged arteries, inflammatory, they're all reversible. These diseases go away. I wish someone had told me that when I was a first year med student, that these are reversible diseases. If you get them on a whole food plant-based diet, it's a stunning what happens. The obesity starts to melt away and the arteries open up and the high blood pressure goes down and the sore joints stop hurting and the, and the asthmatic lungs stop wheezing so much, the migraine headaches get better, the inflamed guts settle down and they turn into normal, healthy people right in front of your eyes. And I tell the students, what greater gift could you want for your patients? What, as, what greater joy as a healer to, to help your patients transform? And yet, not a word of this is mentioned to, to, uh, to young medical students. So the answer is no, we're not teaching our, our students about, uh, uh, about the power of plant-based uh, foods to reverse disease and animal-based ones to cause them. And to that end, we've established our Moving Medicine Forward initiative where I've been going around to the nation's medical schools and giving the students the lecture I wish someone had given me 50 years ago that to tell me these reversible diseases would have changed every diagnosis I ever made. And so uh, I went to about 30 medical schools before COVID. Uh, since COVID, I, I can't uh, go gather people in lecture halls anymore. So we put it all online. If people are interested, uh, Google uh, Masterclass in Plant-Based Clinical Nutrition. And uh, it's a 12-unit series on, on using plant-based nutrition to get people healthier. So we're trying to repair that deficit. And I'm working with the American College of Lifestyle Medicine to get 
nutrition-based questions asked on the national board exams because the medical, medical students and medical schools say, listen, they don't ask about it on the national boards. We're not going to teach nutrition. So we're trying to get nutrition questions on national boards so they will, uh, uh, they'll ask about it. So slowly, slowly, slowly it's changing, but it's the, the major gaping deficiency in medical education and unfortunately in medical practice. And the most common complaint I get from patients is why doesn't my doctor know anything about nutrition? I asked him a question about nutrition, he threw me out of the office. Um, that, that era has to, we have turned the page on that. Doctors need to welcome those questions because it's the most powerful tool they have to get their patients truly healthy. Are some people being born in parts of the United States and the world where they don't have access to fresh produce and healthy food and are eating diets of processed food, sugar, soda, and other undesirable foods? What impact is it having on their health and their communities? That's such an important question. Uh, and I hope your the viewers heard that question uh, because so many of the people when you know, in med school, we learn about how to diagnose everything from smallpox to leprosy. But when we open the door in our waiting room, medical of our medical offices or in the emergency room, the people who are sitting there, I, I have, uh, there are a large group of people, a small group of diseases, and most of them are obese and diabetic and hypertensive, the diseases I mentioned. And so much of it has to do with the food stream. And it's most, and it's commonly, not all, but mostly, um, has something to do with the processed foods from the world of fast foods. Why? Because it's easier for a single mother with three hungry kids to go to the fast food restaurant, load up with, with burgers and, and shovel in all that fat and sugar and salt uh, and animal protein into the kids for relatively cheap price, even though and she doesn't even know it's all government subsidized. If those burgers sold for what it really costs to produce it, if the, if the ranchers had to pay for the water and the soil erosion and the greenhouse gases, those burgers would cost 50 bucks a piece. But now you buy them for a buck 98 because they're government subsidized. But, but the point is, it, it is easier and the kids like it. And so they're stuck, they get, and they develop real taste for real hunger. And, uh, and, and they get stuck in this, in this channel that fast foods is what you eat. And, and the results are devastating for their health. The kids are obese and we're seeing diabetes. We no longer use the term adult onset diabetes. We're seeing it in 10 year old kids now. Uh, and we've seen strokes in teenagers, you know, we're, we're, they're in this terrible channel. And a lot has to do, as I said, with, with the fast foods that you mentioned. Um, because the flip side is these folks live in it's a it's a heart wrenching term food desert, and the you know, the only place you can get anything resembling food is a couple of of brown bananas at the Seven Eleven checkout cashier there, uh, but but you know that's uh, the, you know the convenience stores are the places and that's just intolerable. So how do we fix this? First of all, it requires breaking through, demolishing that myth that, oh, I can't eat this way. Yeah, the doc, I know it's healthier, but, uh, but it's too expensive. The way you guys are eating, that's for you elites. Uh, we, I can't afford that I, I'm, on my budget. Stop right there. The staples where you get the, your calories and your protein are cheap. Rice and beans are, and lentils are cheap. You can buy a 20 pound bag of rice for six bucks. You can buy 15 pounds of lentils for $10 and they will last you for weeks and weeks. Um, so when it comes to filling up your kids' bellies and your own bellies with healthy whole plant foods, rice, beans, potatoes, they're cheap. And, and so the majority of the food issue, as far as money goes, should dissolve right there. And, it, and but, but the produce is, is a real issue, as you mentioned. So where do you get it? Um, two things. First of all, if you're not putting out money for, for burgers and ice cream, then you've got some money left over to buy some produce. But how do you get it? And, and here's where we really need to come together as a community, as a family. And if people are watching this, uh, and what, what can I do? Well, Google food deserts near me. And, uh, and find out where those food deserts are in your city. And there's so much we can do. The farmer's market, they bring trucks in with fresh produce and they do a mini farmer's market, bring the food to the people. 
Uh, there's community gardens, there's, you know, food banks, there, there's ways to get healthy produce into these families' hands. And we've, we've got to do that. We can't take no for an answer on that. But, and, and that filled, that completes the equation. So the basic staples, the rice and beans and, and, uh, and uh, dried uh, legumes and grains, et cetera, that, that's cheap and, and stable. It's shelf stable. You don't need refrigerated. The buy, you know, stock people up with that and then find a way to get fresh produce into their lives and you'll save their lives. You'll save the community. Um, so, so we can't let that first argument say, well, there's no food around me. There's nothing I can do but eat McDonald's. Uh, we, we've got to, to, with enough love and focus, we can, uh, we can solve that problem. Are there places in the world that now or in the past ate a whole food plant-based diet? And if so, what were the health and longevity statistics for them? Well, this brings us around to Dan Buettner's uh, famous book now called The Blue Zones. And he went around the world to see where people lived the longest, where were the most centenarians, most people over 100 years old. And he found five areas around the world, uh, Okinawa, the uh, islands in, uh, off the coast of Greece, um, and uh, Loma Linda in, in Southern California. Uh, and he looked, what are these people eating? And let me say right off the bat, none of them were pure vegans. Um, but the majority of what went down their gullet every day grew out of the ground. They, these are folks who lived on uh, grains and beans and fruits and vegetables. They, they, and all respect, or little respect to Mr. the doctor who's going out against lectins now. Uh, don't eat beans, they have lectins. Well, all the, the one commonality among all these blue zone diets, every one of them ate, had legumes in their diet, they all ate beans. Uh, so it, it obviously can't cut your life short if that's where the most centenarians were. Um, but, and these folks, you know, there, it wasn't, it was beyond just the food. Um, and you see these wonderful pictures, the hundred year old Okinawan farmer going up to his uh, garden with a, with a hoe over his shoulder with a smile on his face. For, there's a lot in that picture. First of all, he's growing his own food. He's doing physical work out in the sunshine. And he knows when he brings those veggies home, he's loved and respected by the people in his family who he's brought into this world. That's what, what supports a whole human being. And, and, and the majority of what goes down their gullets grew out of the ground. Uh, they may have a little fish or lamb or whatever once a week, twice a week, but it's a plant-based diet. So, uh, but the folks who eat these animal heavy diets, I mentioned the, uh, the, uh, uh, the, the uh, Bushmen in, um, in Kenya, the, uh, uh, the, the Inuits up in the Arctic, uh, when they dig up their skeletons and look, uh, they weren't healthy folks, osteoporosis, uh, clogged arteries. Uh, so the plant-based diets are by far the ones that are associated with long in pretty healthy lives. So uh, that's, that's where I'll put my money and I suggest my patients do the same. Can't we get too much sugar from eating large quantities of cooked beans and whole, whole grains? Interesting question. Now, uh, the answer, um, um, I'll come right out and say, no, we can't. Uh, why not? A um, couple of reasons. Um, I mean, how much, how many beans can you have? Three cups, four cups, five cups of beans? I'm good heavens. There comes a point if they're in their whole form, you can't, physically can't eat that much. And the, uh, and without getting too much into the chemistry, where, where's the sugar coming from? The sugar is coming from starches, which are just sugars all uh, uh, strung together. Uh, and when we eat, say, a potato, uh, the sugars that are all linked together uh, in that form of starch there, the sugars are broken up, um, the, the bonds between them are, are, are severed, and the sugar comes into the blood and you can really can raise your sugar, your, your sugar for an hour or two, it comes back down, it's not a, it's not a terrible uh, catastrophe. Um, and those are with you know the starchy root vegetables. Why am I saying that? Because the beans, which is what the question involved, is less prone to do that. Um, the sugars in the starches in beans and lentils and other legumes, they are really tightly bound to each other. And so much so they're called resistant starches. 
because they will make it all the way through 22 feet of small intestine, even though they're being bathed with starch digesting enzymes, the amylase from the pancreas into the small intestine, they're, they're resistant to those enzymes and they make it through those 22 feet of small intestine to make it down to our colon, where the colon bacteria know how to, uh, uh, know, know how to uh, dismantle those resistant starches, but they in turn turn it into good things, into short chain fatty acids, uh, and uh, that nourish our colon and don't raise our blood sugar. So because you can't eat, you know, how many pounds of beans you're going to eat? Not very much. Uh, and the fact they're filled with resistant starches, uh, the reality is that they're one of the most friendly uh, glycemic index foods because uh, they don't raise your blood sugar very much at all. So enjoy your legumes. Uh, now, that said, I've had some people... Um, uh, stop eating meat. Oh, I'll use leg I'll use beans to make up for the protein in there. And they go right from eating no beans to two cups of bean chili or four cups of lentil stews. And oh man, that that can really when when that hits the colon when your colon wasn't ready prepared for it, uh, you can generate a lot of gas and distress, etc. So if you're new to legumes, just start with a tablespoon or two every day, and then slowly build up. Take a couple of weeks before you get into big bowls of, of bean chili and lentil stew. But if you give your colon bacteria some time to adjust. Uh, don't worry about what the legumes are going to do to your blood sugar. They're, it just isn't going to uh, raise it to any significantly high level. Do flour products make you fat? Do flour products make you fat? Uh, the short answer to the, yep, they sure can, but there's some chemistry behind that. And I'm not a big fan of flour products uh, for a couple of reasons. One, when you eat... Um, a, a whole, uh, uh, you know, some whole rice or barley. Um, it takes hours for the, your digestive enzymes to work their way into that piece of barley that's down in your intestines uh, and for the, the amylase enzymes to break up the sugars. And, uh, and as a result, uh, the amount of sugar, what little tiny little fat there is in, in barley oil, you know, it gets into the bloodstream very slowly. It's cleared out very quickly. doesn't cause much of a problem. But when you send, well, not barley so much, but the wheat uh, or the oats to the miller and they grind it into powder called flour, but when that stuff leaps into your bloodstream and many times, especially the white flour products, they really raise your blood sugar, which raises your insulin level, makes you store uh, fats and other uh, uh, substances might be in the, in the bloodstream at the time. So by its very nature of its higher absorbability and, and ability to raise blood sugar higher, and thus insulin level higher, uh, yeah, it can lean uh, towards making people fat. But again, the, the carbohydrates burn pretty quickly. It's not going to turn into fat. Um, uh, let's, let's just say this. When, no matter how much rice you eat, it's not really going to turn into fat in its whole form. We'll come back to the flour in a second. And why? Because when you eat carbohydrates like corn or potatoes or, or wheat, what really happens? Um, the, the sugars that are in those, uh, in those starchy foods get into the bloodstream. Um, it will be, the sugar will be sent to your muscles and your liver to be stored there as form of glycogen. But when your glycogen uh, stores are full in your muscles and your liver, any more rice or sugar, um, your body's just going to burn it off as heat. Uh, you'll, uh, your, blood, your body tends to go up a quarter of a degree. Uh, you'll stick your foot out from under the covers at night and you'll radiate that heat off of the air. It's not going to turn into fat. Uh, so in that way, pure sugars, they're not really going to turn into fat, but the, in the real world, what happens is this, and sorry for the chemistry here, but, um, there's something called oxidative priority. And that means it's easier to burn sugar than burn fat. It's easier to blow apart a glucose molecule than metabolize a long chain fat. So if you eat sugar and fat at the same time, if you put oil on your pasta, say, um, your body will burn the sugar and you'll store the fat for later. So that fat-sugar combo is what really puts the weight on you. So where do the flour products come in? Um, 
all ba- all goods from the bakery, where muffins, cakes, donuts, whatever, are combinations of fat and sugar. You've got the, the, the sugar is the pastry flour. What's holding that muffin together? It's like a, there's some kind of fat in there. There's a sugar. There, there's, a, there's shortening. There's egg yolk. There's oil. There's some kind of fat. All baked goods are that fat-sugar combo. And in that way, will flour products, because nobody eats raw flour, they're all, it's always combined with a, with a fat. And yes, in that way, flour products in the presence of fat, will, it certainly will contribute to, to, uh, to weight gain and fat deposition. So long answer, but uh, flour products, the way they're commonly consumed, yes, they are certainly quite fattening. Uh, most breads are, unless they just have flour and water in them, uh, but, if, but read the label. If you see any oil or egg yolk, whatever, uh, it's going to be a fattening product. Do you recommend eating the new popular vegan burgers that are made from a variety of pea and similar proteins? Oh my, I've been in the plant-based health world now since 1981. And, uh, and when I first became vegan and, uh, uh, and I got into health food eating. There, there were these veggie burgers, and they were just dismal. They were just kind of oatmeal patties that fell, it fell apart in your, in your hands and along your mouth. And I, well, they were kind of amusing things I never really uh, uh, put much stock into. Now, the Boca burgers were a bit of improvement back in the 90s. But we've all been amazed and somewhat impressed as science marches on and those brilliant folks the food technologists at Impossible Foods and Beyond Beef came up with these remarkable burgers that for all the world uh, have the taste and texture of a really meaty beef burger. And, uh, and they're quite tasty, they're, they're delicious. So, and as much as that, oh boy, brought me back lots of great memories. The first time I had an Impossible Burger, I had to stop back and say, okay, doctor, is this really a healthy thing to do? And, um, and you can make arguments that it's a processed food. Um, it's uh, full. Some of them have a lot of salt. Some have oils in them. Um, yes, yes, yes. Uh, th- that's true. And for that reason, I can't call it a health food per se. And I sure don't advocate. Uh, you know, the dose makes the poison. You know, if you're going to have what you know once a month as a treat, uh, okay. You know, but uh, to remind you what it used to be like, they have, they have those birds, and you don't want to be eating them four times a week there. So if, if that's the case, do they have any use? You bet. I am so grateful because they're such a great ambassador, a great transition food for Joe meat and potato guy. So I got, I've got to have my meat, but they bite into one of these burgers and, oh boy, that, oh, I could eat that. Oh, that's not bad at all. Man, you've changed that man's life with, with one bite of, the, of one of these burgers. And again, he shouldn't be eating five of them a week. He should have, you know, one a week, once every two weeks. But, it, but if it, as a transition food, it takes people who are so scared of a plant-based diet, it takes them by, hey, you can still have taste, still have texture and enjoyment. It takes them by the hands. Oh, okay, I, I think I could do this. If for that role alone, because it takes the strangeness and the repelling that people are plant-based. Now I need my meat. Uh, It it helps them overcome that. I'm so grateful for these products. And so I will approve them for my new in transition patients, but it's also with the caveat, listen, you don't want to eat these things every day. They're they're a treat food. You have them once a month, twice a month. That's about it. And if you do that and they're part of the transition uh, uh, program for these patients, uh, I'm I'm ha- I'm very grateful that they exist and they do have a limited but a, but an important role to play. Do you recommend people get colonoscopies? Do they save lives? Oh my! There was a time I would say, yeah, everybody needs colonoscopy. But there are some realities involved. Uh, one is, you know, it's expensive, it's uncomfortable, and it's not without risk. You do with colonoscopy. This is taking a an eight foot flexible tube and sliding it up the rectum and up over and down the entire length of the colon. You do that with enough people, do it a thousand, two thousand, you're going to you know, cause some bleeding, you'll cause a perforation. You know, there, it's odds approach certainty that, uh, that a problem can, can arise. 
for what? Um, not to say that the procedure has no value at all. And uh, if someone's had, say, signs of an obstruction, you get an MRI or a CT, and it looks like they got a mass in the, in the lower right side, you know, in their ascending cold, this by the cecum. You bet, man, they need that colonoscopy snake put all the way up there and all the way down and get a biopsy. It, it has an absolute use. I'm not saying there's no use for it. But we're talking about as a screening procedure here. Uh, should you be doing this on thousands of millions of men and women? You know, should you be doing this? Well, then you got to start being a doctor. You have to say, well, who is this person? And um, one, what's their family history and what's their dietary history? If they, if they, if you got a 40 year old guy with some blood in his stool and you ask him, yeah, my father, two brothers and an uncle all died of colon cancer at age 45. Yeah, this, this man should probably have a colonoscopy done. Absolutely. And, and probably one every couple of years you know, after that. Uh, yeah, and especially, oh yeah, man, I love my red meat. I, I eat it, you know, I eat something, you know, some meat two, three times a day. He should have a colonoscopy. The flip side of that, you got a 70 year old guy who's been vegan for 40 years. Uh, no, nobody in my family has ever had colon cancer, not even close. Been eating plant-based for 40 years. I had a colonoscopy once 10 years ago, clean as a whistle. Does this man need another one? The odds of him having sprouted out of colon cancer in the last 10 years are tiny. Um, so you got to just look at who are you talking to, doctor? Who, 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 really, who really needs it? The folks at high risk, yes, there's a place for it and you need to talk to your, your uh, gastroenterologist and decide the screening. Now, if, if uh, they do the colonoscopy and they find a bunch of polyps, these are early precancerous lesions from the cancer causing chemicals in the food rubbing on the colon wall, and you're starting to sprout out a, uh, uh, an early uh, tumor that will turn into a cancer. Uh, if they find a couple of polyps, this man needs repeat colonoscopies every, you know, every couple of years. If there's no, if, they, if it's clean as a whistle they, and there's no polyps and he's a plant-based guy, uh, even if he's got a family history, you know, do another one in three years. If that one's clear again, uh, I would say just uh, this man could just do the, now they have these coligard tests that look for DNA of cancer in the stool. I'd say, man, follow this guy along with you. And, and if and if people do have a polyp that's starting to go malignant. And that polyp will ooze a little blood into the stool mass. You won't see it. It's, it's uh, occult blood, but you can check the stool for occult blood. Uh, and, and I think you could just ride along with checking the stool for occult blood and maybe sending off a coligard every two years or so. And, uh, and the, the plant-based eater with no family history, I think he could ride along with that. So, um, so it depends on the, uh, uh, on the person, their history, their diet. And, um, and be aware also that there's a much less invasive uh, procedure called a flexible sigmoidoscopy. The sigmoid colon is in the first 24 inches of the intestine and about 80% of the colon and about 80% of cancers are in that last two feet of, of, of colon. So, um, so if there's any bleeding or whatever, uh, I will have the doctor slide up a flexible sigmoidoscope there, have that done and you probably can identify the, the bleeding source or the pathology without doing the whole full colonoscopy. So there's you know, a little wiggle room there, so to speak. Uh, but by and large, uh, it depends on the patient's family history and their diet and, and their age, who they really are. So it's got to be decided uh, individually. But by and large, does every man need a colonoscopy every two years? No, they don't. Uh, it depends who they are, what they're eating. Do you recommend plant-based milks like oat, hemp, soy, coconut, almond, cashew, flax, et cetera? Is there anything we need from dairy products? Oh, my. Um, again, having been in the plant-based health food world for 40 plus years, I the, the only plant milks was, was you'd go to one of these uh, health food stores, which is just a, a small little, little wooden floored the tiny little uh, stores you walk in the shopping center uh, and there'd be a bag of powder that says soy milk on it. And you, you put a couple of tablespoons of 
powder into a quart of cold water and stir it up and this dreadful white liquid would, would appear there. It was just tasteless and flat. Uh, well, uh, we've come a long way, baby. And now you, you go to the refrigerator case at Trader Joe's Whole Foods, you see it, it's amazing. And you mentioned the whole lineup there, oat milk, hemp milk, soy, rice, almond, coconut, wonderful. I welcome them all. It's wonderful. And But a couple of caveats about that. One, um, these are treat foods. They're not drinking beverages. The main drinking beverage is water. Uh, and you want to have two, three good glass of water a day. Okay. These are, again, some into the vegetable. They're treat foods. They're, you know, half a cup on your cereal, uh, put a little splash of the creamer in your coffee or your tea. Uh, that's how they should be used. My, my wife and I, our favorite dessert in the evening is, uh, is a cup of blueberries or raspberries. And we'll put some hemp milk or oat milk on that. that that's the way these should be used. And if you're using it on that level, uh, pick the one that's, uh, you know, the, that pleases your palate the most. Yes, there's so there, this, uh, there's the whole thing, almonds use up too much water, and there's phytoestrogens in the soy, and, and uh, those are both, I think, minor considerations. But any question, then go with the hemp milk uh, or the oat milk. Uh, they're really benign. They don't have any of the PR baggage attached to them. So do a little research, but the general answer to a general question is yes, I think they're wonderful products and I'm very glad they're around. And it certainly made my breakfast a lot more interesting by putting oat milk on my oatmeal these days. Does sugar make you fat? Does it age you? No, and yes, the two grams. Does it make you fat? No, uh, for the reasons that I mentioned. Most of the sugar energy is burned off as heat. Um, but if you eat it in the presence of fat, yes, in that way. But it's the fat making you fat. The sugar makes you store it, but it's it's the sugar itself isn't turning into fat. Uh, the only time sugar turns into fat is if you're eating lots of isolated fructose, high fructose corn syrup in a, in a cola drink or in a candy bar or whatever, um, that the body can turn, the liver can turn into triglycerides, a form of fat. And, and yes, uh, the fructose, especially the isolated fructose, not in whole fruit, but isolated fructose can raise your triglycerides. That's true. So it won't make you fat, but it'll raise your blood fats that can damage your arteries. Yes, that's true. But um, uh, in general, the, the big problem with eating sugar is not that it makes you fat, but as you rightly said, it ages us. Um, and again, a little chemistry here, but if you spill maple syrup on the table, everything gets sticky, right? Well, the same thing happens. You drink that cola, you eat that, that candy bar, the, the vegan muffin or vegan chocolate cake, whatever it is, and you, well, let, let me take one mini step back here. I love sweet things like everybody does, okay? And, uh, and a teaspoon of maple syrup in your tea as a flavoring, that's no problem, okay? That's the way it should be used. It's a flavoring, these sweet syrups, et cetera. And, it's, and, and in half teaspoon amounts, enjoy them. That's not a problem. The problem is eating sugar as a food. When you are eating a chunk of vegan chocolate cake, you're eating a hunk of sugar as food. When you're drinking a cold vegan cola, it's you're, you're eating sugar as a food. It was never meant to be eaten as a food. And when you eat it in that amount, the dose makes the poison. It's certainly true here. You eat that much sugar as a, as a food, you flood your tissues with sugar. Well, just like the maple syrup on the table, it sticks to everything. And the sugar molecules stick especially to proteins. They, you glycosylate your proteins. And, um, and your body heat oxidizes that, that, that sticky protein and forms these things called advanced glycation end products. Uh, and again, that's just the, the, the cooked the oxidized sugars that's sticking to protein. Uh, don't worry about the name advanced glycation end products. Remember the initials, A-G-E, it ages you. And that's the problem. Um, the, uh, you, this reaction, uh, you make the proteins in your eye lens all glycosylate. That's a way to get cataracts in your eyes. You glycosylate the proteins in the elastic fibers of your skin. You're, they break and your skin gets all wrinkly like an old suitcase. Uh, you run the 
glycosylation reaction on the inner lining of the arteries in your brain that opens the door to Alzheimer's disease. Eating sugar as a food ages us. That's the real problem, man. It was part of your question. So it won't make you fat per se, but it ages you. And, uh, and joints get creaky and skin gets wrinkled and the vision gets dim. And, uh, and, and it spawns microbes in the gut that, put, that make your mood sour. Uh, it turns you into an old man or an old woman. So don't be eating sugars or food. That's what fruits are for. Have a mango. You know, have, have a few grapes. That's where to get your sweetness from. But don't be eating sugar as a food because it ages you. How do we make sure we get enough minerals from our foods? How do we make sure we're not missing any key ones? Minerals? Um, minerals come from the earth, okay? We're talking about iron and cobalt and selenium, and these are minerals in the soil. And guess what? How can we get minerals in the soil into our body? Eat the plants who grow in that soil. And, uh, and that's the beauty of a whole food plant-based diet. Absolutely, the roots of the... Of the Plants take up the the, uh, the minerals, and and some of them can really be challenging for us. Zinc um, is important in so many enzyme reactions in our body, our skin, our hair, etc. And it can be a little challenging. So that's why you want to eat those beans and lentils and, and whole grains, absolutely. But a, a, a particular type of vegetables that really have great exposure to the soil minerals are the root vegetables that grow under the ground or surrounded by the soil. So sweet potatoes and turnips and carrots uh, have a great role in our diet. They're rich sources of minerals. Um, so, uh, so eat the grains and legumes and the root vegetables daily, really. And uh, you ought to be able to get all the minerals that you really need. That said, there can be a couple that's a little challenging. Uh, one is called selenium that we need. And uh, they're found in Brazil nuts. And a couple of Brazil nuts every day, every other day, smart idea. And another mineral is iodine for your thyroid gland. And if you're not eating fish, um, that where most people get their iodine, uh, where are you going to get it? There should be iodine in the soils. And that's where people have gotten it traditionally. But we've not been treating the soils very, uh, very gently. And we've been pulling out all the vegetables with iodine. And we just put in these same chemical fertilizers with nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium in it. And uh, so we've been mining the soils and taking iodine out. And, and so the vegetables might be short of iodine. So for that reason, uh, you need to make sure you get enough iodine in your diet. Uh, two ways, um, if you want to do it completely naturally, um, uh, there uh, things in the sea have iodine. So uh, you can get organic um, uh, seaweeds. I like wakame from as the green stuff in the, in the Japanese restaurant, uh, arame, uh, and throw a gob onto your salad or into your soup a couple times a week. You'll get the iodine you need. Or um, you don't want to be eating a lot of salt and processed foods, uh, but um, a little salt, a pinch, literally an eighth of a teaspoon on your veggies at the table is an appropriate way to take in a very mild, moderate amount of salt. Uh, and it should be iodized salt, even see iodized sea salt. Uh, and uh, and there, so there's another place you can get some iodine. So uh, those are the two, the three ones, the zinc, selenium, and iodine. So as long as you cover those, eat lots of root vegetables, lots of legumes, uh, you ought to be fine as far as the vegetables, as far as the minerals go. How do we protect ourselves against COVID-19? Oh my, COVID-19, what, what an earth change, a society changing, earth encircling phenomenon we've seen, just been stunning how it's affected every one of us. Uh, and there's all the society and the psychological and sociologic havoc it's, it's inflicted on us, uh, caused me great concern. But your question is particularly medical one. The, the, there's the viral infection itself. Uh, and the majority of people who get infected either feel nothing or they feel a little achy or flu -y and they get a cough for a couple of days and they're fine, especially the younger you are. Uh, but uh, older folks, 
and especially folks who are obese and diabetic, uh, this virus can deck you, can kill you. And, but we're even seeing deaths uh, from in young people and, and middle-aged folks. Uh, just because you're under 30 doesn't mean you, this, this disease, this virus can't really turn your lungs into guacamole. It's a powerful virus in, in the wrong body there. So what can you do to protect yourself? Um, one, don't get it, okay? And and I know there's you know, a lot of people anti-mask and masks don't work. Masks do work, uh, and surely, uh, especially double masking. But for the 15 minutes you're in the store, put the freaking mask on. You know, no one's saying you got to wear it first thing in the morning at home. You know, but if you're going out and you're among people, um, it's a, a common courtesy to the to the person at the checkout counter of the supermarket for her sake, for his sake, put on the mask. Don't, don't be breathing on him. And the example that it sets for people is important. Uh, and um, and it might even help you from inhaling it. But stay in those places where the air is moving. Yeah, you won't get uh, COVID infection if you're outside for a walk or for a bike ride. That's safe. And if you're in a big supermarket with industrial air circulation around there, the odds of you inhaling enough virus particles uh, from the guys a few feet away, uh, it doesn't happen there. It happens in small spaces with stagnant air in, at the, in the end of the bar, uh, in, in a tavern, uh, in an intimate restaurant where the air is stagnant and they don't have the fans. That's when people coughing uh, right in your neighborhood, that's how you get infected. So stay out of those situations. Um, so, you know, that take care of 90% of the problem. Keep your immune system strong. Uh, you want to, if you do encounter it, you want your immune system to nail it. So again, eat lots of fresh foods. Don't be eating everything cooked and fried, et cetera. And those two diseases I mentioned, obesity and diabetes, man, will kill you. Uh, the COVID virus really likes those kind of bodies. And in a way, it's it's been a, I wouldn't say a blessing because people haven't acted on it, but um with those conditions, obesity and diabetes, they're, they're, those are someday diseases. Ah, well, one of these, I'll lose some weight one of these days. I'll get around to controlling my diabetes better. Well, one thing COVID has done is taken those someday I'll work on those diseases uh, stance and brought it right in front of the, your obesity is a risk to you now. It is a, it, your diabetes is a risk to you now. It, you're, the odds of you dying if you get this are higher because of these diseases. And there's been so many missed opportunities the way this pandemic has been handled. It would have been so great if last spring during the first lockdown, the doctors got on the air and say, listen, people, you're going to be home for a couple of months. Use this time. Get yourself healthier. Start eating healthy. Start working out in your living room. Go for a walk every day. We'll emerge from this cocoon leaner and healthier and smarter. But we didn't. And people are doing the opposite. They're sitting home, shoveling in the Oreos and getting fatter and sicker. And that, that's not a good thing. So as an individual, use this time. Get yourself uh, in really good physical shape. So those are the best thing. Avoid the situations where you may get sick. Get yourself really uh, healthy as far as your immune system and certainly healthy as far as these diseases. Should we get the vaccine? Um, it's certainly making medical sense. And, um, uh, and uh, you know, I certainly have uh, the people who want to get the vaccines. I have no, uh, no real objections. I'm keeping my eye on the long-term consequence. I want to make sure that people who uh, a year later don't get autoimmune diseases or lupus or uh, lymphoma. But it doesn't seem to be happening. And so it's building my confidence that, yeah, they're, they're probably pretty safe. So I'm feeling better and better every month that goes by uh, about these vaccines, even though they're new RNA style vaccines, um, uh, uh, RNA style of, uh, of vaccines. I won't, won't go into that. And finally, as Dr. Michael Greger says, um, we're, you know, we've seen the horrific cost this one not particularly lethal virus, even though it's killed half a million Americans. It's not, it doesn't kill every other person like, so like Ebola can. Um, well, as Dr. Greer says, this, this COVID-19, this might just be a warm up act uh, for what is being brewed up in, in the massive factory farms, all those anonymous sheds out in the countryside, each one of them houses half a million chickens, uh, 10,000 pigs, 
And these are all, as Dr. Gregor said, these are all Petri dishes with curly tails. They're all swapping viruses back and forth. And the next COVID, a much more lethal one, is ready to jump out and to create even more havoc. And, and again, it's all the more reason to complete the circle, why we should adopt a plant-based diet as a society and make these the factory farms disappear before the next virus jumps out and devastates us on a personal and societal level. So again, a plant-based diet is the key to our survival individually and as a species, as well as elim eliminating all that dreadful suffering the animals are going through because of the factory farms. So all the way around, plant-based diets are where it's at. So get yourself healthy and, uh, and stay out of closed small spaces. How do we solve America's healthcare crisis? How do we sell a stop America, solve America's healthcare crisis? Welcome to stop kidding yourself. You know, we, well, um, we, you know the, the, this is the age of disinformation, and we've seen it you know, turn our politics into something grotesque. Well, it's doing the same with our public health, and advertising all along. You know is. Like Dr. McDougall says, people love to hear good news about bad habits. Oh, meat's good for you. Paleo is good for you. And this is disinformation. We are plant-eating hominids. The more whole plant foods we eat, the leaner and healthier and more vital we get. That's the baseline, bottom line truth of it. And anything on top of that are just rationales for to feed our tongue glutton. Oh, we love that juicy steak and that ice cream. Uh, but these are foods of death. Uh, if we eat healthy, we'll be healthy. Uh, as Dr. Goldhammer says health comes from healthy living. So we solve America's health uh, problems by getting healthy, by educating ourselves, adopting a whole food plant-based diet and helping the farmers transition. You know, people are going to throw the farmers off the land. No, they're growing our food just to do something else with the land. You don't have to run cattle on it. You don't have to run a dairy operation. Grow fruit trees, grow broccoli, grow hemp, grow, let them pay them to have the forest come back. Pay these people and send them to night school, learn how to grow these vegetables, buy their you know, buy their equipment for them, buy their seeds for them, ensure their crops, send their kids to college. Make it easy for these people to transition. Uh, and, um, and I urge people, there is now an organization lobbying Congress to pass that legislation. It's called the Agricultural Fairness Alliance, AFA. Get on their website, support them, help the farmers and ranchers transition to truly health supporting crops that are gentle with the land and will support them as well. So uh, how do we get America healthy? change what we're eating and change what we're growing and everything gets better from there. How do you fix gastrointestinal issues? Do some whole plant-based foods make gastrointestinal issues worse? You mentioned gluten. What about gluten? How do you make sure you don't get celiac disease? Well, there's several uh, issues in that question. Celiac disease is, is a specific reaction against gluten in people in that 10, 2%, 3% of the people who are violently reactive against gluten. I mean, it causes a official, it rips up their, the lining of their intestine uh, and causes all sorts of havoc. That's celiac disease. And these people should get it diagnosed. It's, if, if you're in that situation, if every time you eat some something with wheat in it, you're in the toilet for two hours afterwards, you've got gluten, you probably got celiac disease. These people just need to avoid the gluten. But on the, uh, but all the other issues that are implied in your question, everything from constipation to irritable bowel syndrome, Crohn's disease, colitis, all those bowel diseases, um, uh, what to do about them? Well, I guess you, you know uh, where I'm going to go with this. Uh, the answer is going to be a whole food plant-based diet. But, but seriously, you know, I've never had a gorilla in the office saying, Doc, I, I'm constipated. I don't know what, what to eat. Um, the gorillas, the, as the researchers show us, they're eating leaves and fruit all day. And they pass three, four times a day. They pass these big, soft, bulky stools with no blood in them. They're not constipated, et cetera. And that's the truth of it. You eat a high fiber, you, know, you eat a whole food plant-based diet with lots of fiber. You're going to be passing these large, soft, easy to move bowel movements once or twice a day. 
and they're easy for the colon wall to get a purchase on these stool masses. So they, they had a lot of high pressure doesn't build up in the colon, popping out these diverticuli, making the hemorrhoidal veins bulge. Uh, all that goes away uh, with a, the proper diet. That's what the intestine is made to, uh, to run on. And uh, the inflammatory molecules that are in a fast food diet, when you think about it, the cooked animal protein, the, the vegetable oil, the French fries were fried in full of free radicals, the high fructose corn syrup, the phosphoric acid in the cola drinks, this chemical onslaught that, that tears up the gut wall and creates irritable bowel and colitis on a whole food plant-based diet. If you're just eating rice and beans and greens and fruits, that, that's a very benign, bland, you know, chemically bland stool mass. And, and as it moves through the intestine, it gives the message chemically to the intestinal wall, shh, calm down, everything's okay. And there, there's no reason that stool mass is going to cause bloody stools and an inflammation. So it comes down to eat, eating that whole plant food diet is the way to, to have a healthy intestinal tract. And, uh, and these diseases that the gastroenterologists, God bless them, make their careers on, most of them just go away. The, the colitis goes away, the constipation goes away, and people, you know, pass these nice stools. Yeah, um, the, you're going to be eating carbohydrates and the colon bacteria are going to ferment some of those carbohydrates into, into carbon dioxide and methane. Uh, and uh, so uh, you're, you're going to be producing some intestinal gas. There's air in, in the salad and the broccoli. And so you're going to be swallowing air. And in between those two sources of intestinal gas, swallowed air and, and uh, the CO2 and methane from fermentation of some starches, uh, you're going to have some gas. And, and all mammals fart. We all do. And everybody passes gas. That's not a disease. That's no reason. Oh, I can't eat this diet. It gives me gas. Everyone's going to, going to uh, you know, pass a little wind there. One of the nice things, though, you know, if you don't mind me getting a little, a little physiologic here, um, the thing about the the flatus, uh, the gas that people pass rectally, um, <laughs> when people are eating the standard diet with um, with meat in it. Um, the, the colon bacteria turn that meat into very foul smelling gases, uh, um, corpusine and putrescine, uh, and they smell terrible. And, uh, but um, rice and beans don't do that. And one thing people notice is, you know, they may pass a lot of women. Gee, my farts don't smell anymore, you know, and my wife, though, my body odors are going away. That's because those molecules aren't getting out into your skin oils. And so even though you may pass a wind, it's a vast of intestinal gas. It's, it's, it's so much less offensive all the way around. So don't, don't let that be a sign that you can't eat the plant-based diet. You can, and, and all mammals fart is okay. So it's a badge of honor in a way. And, um, and that's not a disease. So yes, does it, does it solve intestinal problems? It absolutely does. And uh, you'll have a normal, healthy, functioning intestinal tract as a reward for eating all the desire we were the diet we were designed to run on. How do you prevent cancer? How do you present prevent cancer? Guess what? Um, <laughs> a whole food plant based diet, and you know it's uh, being a little flip. But let's talk about this. Um, the very act of cooking meat. Nobody eats raw meat. Uh, the very act of of broiling that steak, grilling that chicken breast frying that burger, um, you, you inevitably create, uh, as the DNA and the proteins in that animal muscle get cooked at hundreds of degrees, it produces some very potent cancer-causing molecules, aromatic polycyclic hydrocarbons. These are carcinogenic. And they rub on the stomach wall, they rub on the colon wall, um, uh, meal after meal, year after year. And there's no question the meat eaters get more uh, colon cancer, more, uh, more stomach cancer. But also these carcinogenic cancer-causing molecules get absorbed into the bloodstream and they're sent to other tissues. We find women with breast cancer that get more, have more of this, uh, uh, of these carcinogenic hydrocarbons, not only in their breast tissue, it gets in the breast milk. What's that doing to the baby's risk? 
of a leukemia or something down the road there. So a meat-based diet is a major player uh, in, um, uh, in cancer formation. Plus, as I mentioned a while back, when you eat meat, your liver responds with a gush of hormones called insulin-like growth factor one, IGF-1. It's the most powerful, one of the most powerful growth promoting hormones in the body. And it's fine if you're a growing child, you want lots of IGF-1, yay, grow big and strong. But if you're a woman with an early breast cancer or a guy with an early prostate cancer growing, the last thing you want is a diet that produces gush after gush of IGF-1 as growth promoting factor. And the meat eaters, when they do develop a cancer, it grows faster and more aggressively. And so it's another big flashing sign where you, you, we are not carnivorous apes. We are not meat eating hominids here. And so I'm not saying it's the total answer. Certainly cigarette smoking plays a role. Uh, the pesticides, uh, the hydrocarbons in our drinking water. Well, there's, you know, there's a lot of carcinogens around and no question. Uh, and genetics plays a role. If a woman, you know, if, her mother, two aunts, and a sister all died of breast cancer at age 30. And, you know, it's clearly she's got a genetic propensity, but still all the more reason that she shouldn't wave the red cape in front of the bull there as far as her diet goes. Uh, uh, she should be extra vigilant uh, to eat a stabilizing, non-carcinogenic diet. So um, again, stay out of carcinogenic cancer-causing um, situations. You know, don't smoke. Um, don't, uh, uh, you know, don't be breathing auto exhausted. And um, what, uh, you, you may laugh, but if you're standing on the street corner and a bus is coming by with, with all sorts of fumes spewing out the back, don't breathe that in. As the bus or the truck is coming, as, a, as they approach, take a deep breath in. And then as they pass and lay out that, that plume of, of carcinogenic fumes, and you got to walk through them to get to the other side of the street, Breathe out as you're walking and, and don't you know, make that one little step not to breathe that stuff in. When you're filling your gas tank up, don't keep your face poised over the nozzle and breathe in all those carcinogenic fumes. Turn your face upwind and breathe the fresh air coming in. So take those little steps to avoid as many carcinogens as you can and keep your, your inner tissues healthy with a plant-based diet. And, uh, and don't eat a lot of sugar uh, as a food. And those are the best steps I can give you to avoid cancer. How do you prevent diabetes? How do we prevent diabetes? Uh, such an important question. It's one, it's one simple little question, but it, it opens the door to some very important physiology because uh, if you ask people what caused diabetes, oh, eating too much sugar, high sugar, high sugar. Turns out that in the most common form of diabetes, type two diabetes, and over 90% of people with diabetes have type two. It's not the sugar causing the problem. That's the tail of the dog. That's the last thing that goes up. The problem is, is the fat in the diet, the vegetable oils, the meat fat, the dairy fat, the, the fat in our own bodies as we become obese. All this fat clogs up the insulin receptors in our liver and our muscle cells, and um, they inhibit enzymes. So when insulin from the pancreas knocks on the door of the muscle cells saying, hey, we got sugar out in the blood, let's move it into the sugar, into the muscle to burn it. If the, um, uh, if the insulin receptor mechanism is all clogged up with fat, uh, the, the insulin, I can't, I can't respond to insulin's message here. And the sugar stays out in the bloodstream and builds up to high level. And that's where the high blood sugar comes from. But it's not the cause of the problem. It's the, it's the result of the fat clogging up the action of the insulin receptor enzymes. So uh, if people go on a low fat, whole food plant-based diet, the, the fat clogging up the insulin receptors uh, is, is metabolized for energy. The insulin receptors open up and the, the glucose intolerance goes away. The diabetes goes away. So a low fat you need, everyone needs some fat, but you know, I'm talking about a, get it out of whole foods and not out of an oil bottle. I uh, get a handful of walnuts or uh, uh, some ground flax and hemp on your, on your cereal, uh, some olives on your salad. That's where to get your fats, not out of, not out of glass bottles. So if you eat a low fat, whole food, plant-based diet, the odds of you developing type two diabetes are 
could fit, fit in a flea's navel, really, really small. And uh, so that's the best way to avoid uh, diabetes. Whole food plant-based diet, low in, in fats, then only comes from a whole food source, those fats. Take a walk every day. That's important too. How does a man protect against prostate problems? Oh my, uh, similar here. Uh, why do guys get big prostates? Um, the most common reason, again, surprise, surprise, is our diet. Um, all us guys uh, have uh, a, uh, a hormone called testosterone in our body. It makes us one thing that makes us guys. But um, especially when we eat lots of um, testosterone, especially from another animal, we're eating hormones from, that they put uh, both androgens and uh, testosterone-like drugs and uh, estrogens, which are cousins to androgens, uh, into they inject the cattle and they inject the chickens and uh, so uh, and meat itself, uh, whether it's a female chicken or a male steer, there's going to be these hormones in there. And as you flood your own body with it, your liver will turn regular testosterone, puts two hydrogens in it and turns it into dihydro, dihydrotestosterone. And this root makes the prostate get big and uh, it may even open the door to prostate cancer. Um, and now exacerbating that, I feel, is our sedentary lifestyle. Um, you know, we, a million years ago on the African savannas there, we spent all day moving, man, from the moment your eyelids woke up, you were up moving, getting water, foraging for, for roots and tubers to eat, climbing trees, running away from leopards, getting out. I mean, we were physically active. Now we sit in front of computers hour after hour. We sit in the car, we sit watching TV, we sit, we eat, we sit, we sit, we sit. Why is that an issue? Because gravity is relentless and it pulls blood down to our lower parts of our body. Our leg veins distend and, and we, uh, we dump lots of blood down into our leg veins by the end of the day. Well, around the prostate, there is a, uh, a plexus of veins. And as we sit at our, in our computer chair, gravity is pulling blood down to our pelvic vein plexus. And the veins in the prostate get engorged and swollen and stag and the blood stagnates a bit as it goes through. And all these things that contribute to that prostate gland get more engorged and, and, I think, and the hormones uh, play into it. So a whole food plant-based diet and guys should be active every hour, get up, uh, go, go walk, um, do some yoga. Uh, and while you're on that yoga mat, uh, put a block or a pillow under your hips, get your bum up in the air there, and let the blood drain away from your pelvic area every couple hours there. You know, that would probably help as well. So a, a whole food plant-based diet, you know, only moderate in fats and exercise uh, that keeps the blood circulating, uh, best way I know to, um, uh, to reduce the chances of a big prostate. How much food can you eat on a whole food plant-based diet before you start gaining excess weight? How much food can you eat? Well, again, uh, uh, the, the glory, you know, we keep saying it's always become one word, whole food plant-based diet. You know, whole food, stop whole food. You know, we're talking about whole kale, carrots, collards, beans. How, how many apples can you eat? You know, six, eight, Ten. I mean, the food, the the stomach only holds a quart. If it's whole foods, if it's a fresh salad full of romaine lettuce and carrots and celery and kale and leaves or whatever, and a big bowl of vegetable soup, man, that's you're filling your belly up with fiber and water. Uh, but the calorie density is so low, we only ate a couple hundred calories. So when you talk about food. You know, there's food and there's food. You know, if it's whole food and it's plant-based, yeah, vegans get lean because you, know, you, you physically just can't eat that much food. And, and the food that you eat is mostly fiber and water. It, it's uh, the calorie density is so low. That, that's one of the beauties, one of the joys of a whole food plant-based diet is guilt-free eating. I never once, it never crossed my mind as I'm about to tuck into a big big plate of, of, of bean chili and with the veggies, etc. Do I think, mm, how many calories are here? How much can I eat before I gain weight? Never crosses my mind. Um, again, yeah, it's mostly fiber and water. I'm going to pass a big stool the next morning and it doesn't stick to you, this, this fruit. 
Now, once you get into processed food, once you get into flowers and oil products on the plant-based side, and certainly once you get into meat, uh, now you this is dense and it's full of fat, and you can this will make you fat. You eat a bunch of fat and sugar in the form of processed foods and meats and dairy, which is meant to turn little calves into big calves. You eat, yeah, those foods in, yeah, you ought to be concerned about how much you're eating, what you're eating, because you are going to get fat. But as long as the whole food plant-based diet, enjoy, if you have a fourth bowl of vegetable soup, who cares? It's vegetable soup. And uh, so the, the beauty of this is it's whole plant foods, it's fiber and water, and keeps you nice and lean. So the answer to that question, if, it's, if you're staying on the whole food plant-based side is no. <laughs> and uh, uh, eating too much food won't make you fat. How, how many apples can you eat? Why was it important for you to come back and speak with us here at the Real Truth About Health Conference? Oh, my. When I was first asked to come to New York, I remember by Steve Shore, the, the Real Truth About Health. Wow. Uh, what, a, what a brave uh, banner to put on your conference. That uh, Anyone who said they got the real truth about something, uh, boy, they better know what they're talking about. But when it comes down to, to health and eating, you know, I've been a physician for almost 50 years and I've seen what our standard American diet does uh, as far as creating obese, sick, clogged up people. And I've seen what whole food plant-based diets create lean, healthy people with normal blood sugars and normal blood pressures. It's the truth of it. We're plant eating creatures. And, and the truth is if we stick to that kind of food stream, we're gonna be healthy. And so I, I thought long and hard by the first time I appear, do I, do I want to put my name on a, on a uh, uh, conference building itself as the real truth? But yeah, I worked out my courage and did because, because I, in my heart, this is the truth. Uh, and, uh, and science bears that out. You can't open a medical journal these days without seeing some article about plant-based diets helping disease X, whatever, you know, pick your disease, plant-based diet helps. It's certainly the truth of it. So I, so each year I see this conference, I go, yeah, good for you guys, you know, keep getting the word out. And so in answer to your question, why did I want to come back? And for the same reason, the, and especially now with the paleo nonsense and the keto nonsense and the, and then the obesity from from the, from the pandemic inactivity, et cetera, more than ever, we need the real truth about this, that whole plant-based diets make you, make you healthy. And so anything that, that, you know, there's so much static and disinformation out there, anything labeled the truth that can, that can pierce the, 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 the arm, the, the fuzzy armor of the, uh, of, of the disinformation, I'm all for it. And so uh, I think Steve and you and the folks running this conference, uh, it's a courageous thing you're doing and it's a vital thing and the people need to hear the real truth about health. So for that reason, I'm honored to, to contribute and to you know, strike whatever chord I can in this symphony of uh, painting a picture of a truly healthy diet and lifestyle. So you bet I was, uh, I was honored to uh, accept the invitation and I hope another one comes around. And again, in a couple of years, I really commend Steve Shore and you and all of you pu putting out this wonderful conference about the real truth about health. So that's why I came back and look forward to doing it again. Well, thank you. It's an honor for us to have you bring us the real truth. And for us and our audiences, it's so, so very meaningful, all of your work. And uh, I want to thank you, especially, of course, for all of your time today and uh, making this uh, exceptional video with us. Thank you. If anyone would like to learn more about what we're doing, uh, go to my website, drclapper.com, all spelled out, D-O-C-T-O-R-K-L-A-P-E-R.com. And there you'll find our Moving Medicine Forward initiative where we're, uh, where we're reaching the medical students about nutrition, as well as our masterclass in plant-based nutrition, uh, good for all health professionals to know. So uh, come to my website. And, and if you want to make an appointment with me, for a medical consultation, go to plantbasedtelehealth.com and uh, you can, uh, we can arrange a, an actual uh, com, uh, consultation for your own health. Thanks for letting me get that information out as well. And those were excellent questions. You did a great job as an interviewer. Thank well, you so much. Th thank you so much. We really do appreciate it. And, and again, for, for everything you do and, uh, and be well. Be well. Be well. Take care. Thanks, Dr. Clapper. Bye-bye.
拜拜。